found during uh, w- during a loading process where the the scientists or the NASA team they found that they, they found that uh, there was a small indent in then uh, there, there was a small indent on the eight inch diameter liquid of hydrogen seal. So they had to solve that problem and to test if the problem was solved, they had to run a cryogenic demonstration test. This test was a process whereby they had to load a super cold liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen into the space launch, uh, the space launch system rockets to, uh, to, to actually confirm if the leak was still there or not. And according to the update, it was resolved. So that's good. Now the new launch date is now on the 27th, which is uh, next week Tuesday. Hopefully nothing wrong should go and we should have our launch by then. Just a quick, we want to have like a, a, an, the updates on the Artemis 1. And basically like what is it exactly? The Artemis 1 is, a first, is the first test flight of the Space Launch System rockets and Orion spacecraft as an integrated system. Now what this means is that the Space Launch System rocket is what is the thrust. That's what's able to give thrust to the Orion spacecraft which is basically a module where the crew is going to be in. So, uh, so with the rockets and the Orion spacecraft, poof, we have Artemis 1. Artemis 1 will be an uncrewed mission, but actually it's, we're going to have a couple of stuff on it. That's uh, Sean the sheep and, uh, and Snoopy the dog. I think I have some photos, some of you may recognize kind of difficult to go back you have uh, some of you may, may recognize this character this is snoop uh, snoopy the dog and he and he has secured a, a seat on the on the mission as well as uh, as well as sean the sheep i'm sure some of you have have recognized this this character before Yay. So these two, these, these two animals will be the crew on Atomis One. Okay. Um, let's go on. The mission priorities operate systems in an in-flight environment, ensure a safe re-entry, descent, splashdown, and recovery. So once these priorities are met, we are assured that the future missions that are uh, Atomis Two and Atomis Three. Artemis 2 is a crewed flight beyond the moon. So this time we are going to have uh, human beings on the on the mission. Uh, yeah, that's it. The Artemis 1 is successful. Yeah. And the Artemis 3 is actually is something really interesting. And we're gonna be landing the first woman and the first person of color on the moon. So I think that's a year for everybody in that side. <laughs> Okay, now we're going to talk about the DART mission. That's a double asteroid redirection test. That spacecraft is designed to impact an asteroid as a test of technology. Can we make an asteroid change course if it looks like it's heading for it? This uh, DART spacecraft was launched last year on 24th November and the impact date is going to be this coming Monday, the, on the 26th of September. Looking at the photo we have here, you can realize that uh, in this system is composed of two asteroids, Didymos and Dimorphos. Dimorph- the, the smaller asteroid, the, the Dimorphos, it's, it orbits around Didymos and uh, during the impact, during the the time of the the time of the impact, the DART spacecraft is going to have a nearly head-on collision with the with the with the small asteroid that's the dim of the dim of force, and it's supposed to uh, decrease the orbital period around the Dimos. Originally, the orbital period is around eleven hours fifty-five minutes, but when the DART spacecraft 
uh, hits the, the asteroid, hits the asteroid, it's supposed to reduce the orbital period by several minutes. So that should give us a confirmation that if an asteroid is heading towards Earth and you send a spacecraft to hit it, it's going to change the course of the, the asteroid. Now, one may, 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 may ask or wonder, we launched the DAS spacecraft last year, so why are we making the impact this Monday? And, and the reason is that even though the Dimorphos asteroid is orbiting around the, the, the Didymos, like the bigger one, Didymos is, is actually moving around space too. So on the 26th of September, uh, the distance between Earth and Didymos is going to be minimized. So during the impact, we can have our telescopes around the world actually visualizing the impact live. So we have a high quality footage of the impact. That's why it's on the 26th of September. Okay. Moving on. Uh, latest images of the James Webb Telescope. There's a quick question here. Which planet is this? You have like 30 seconds to put it in the chat and we move on. There's the latest image from the web telescope. Yeah. Okay, so ours is in the chat. What, which which <laughs> pla planet you think this is? It could be Mars, it could be Earth, Jupiter, Saturn, anything. <laughs> Are you timing, Daniel? <laughs> we've got quite a few different options. We've got Saturn, we've got Neptune, we've got Mars. Someone says it could be a star. <laughs> Sorry about that, everybody. This is modern technology for you. So while I think I actually have a copy of that, uh, so I'll, I'll try and look for that. But yes, basically it was Neptune. Now, I know when you see that picture, you think, oh, that looks just like Saturn because of the rings, but actually all the outer planets have rings. It's not just Saturn, but Saturns are the most um, extensive and also they're mainly made of ice. So they're very uh, reflective. So all the other planets' rings, you know, you, you really need a, a good telescope to see them, whereas Saturn's rings are quite easy to see. Daniel, you're back. Hurrah. You didn't know if you were deliberately keeping people in suspense for a long time. No. I'm afraid I've told them the answer now because I wasn't sure when you'd come back. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. So my notes are just went. I think I was back now. So hopefully it should be stable. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, so quickly moving on. Um, and then quickly, yeah. So you need to share your Web. screen again. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, now it's visible. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. So moving f forward and. The web, the James Webb Telescope has. Please, everyone should mute. Um, yeah, hi, it's you. Hi, it's you. That's how it does to, uh, to view seven of Neptune's moons. That's uh, the, the Galatia, Nanaya, Tarasa, the Spina, Proteus, Larissa, and Triton. So, one, two, three, four, five, six seven and one thing you notice is that the triton moon it looks quite different like from the the six down here and that's because scientists has discovered that actually triton is actually an unusual moon of neptune such that it's it orbits in a backward uh orbit around neptune in like in quotes called the retrograde because it goes backwards and this has led the astronomers to speculate that actually Triton is actually a creeper built object, which was gravitationally like captured by, by Neptune. And actually the creeper built is just a circumstellar disk that has ice, rocks, rough planets and comets, which actually extends right beyond Neptune's orbit. 
So because of that, they think that it was a capable object which was gravitationally captured by by Neptune. Yeah. So in future, scientists plan on having having some missions or reach like the having to talk about the tracing and the rest of the moons. Yeah. So time for our guest speaker. Moving on to Sarah. Yes, great. Thank you, Daniel. So yes, I mean, there's astronomy, there's always exciting astronomy news. So yes, you can look out for the Artemis launch coming up, the DART impact coming up, and then every week or every couple of weeks, there's always new, um, uh, new images from the James Webb to look forward to. So they're always fun. So yes, now we're over to the main part of our, uh, our session. And I'm very excited to introduce our guest, who's also a friend, I have to say, Margaret uh, Ikape. Uh, she is a PhD student at the University of Toronto at the Dunlap um, Institute for Astronomy and Astrophysics, which is actually a very prestigious place. Uh, so we're very excited uh, that she's here today. I first met uh, Margaret quite a few years ago, and our paths have crossed a few times at different places. Uh, and I'm always in awe that she's one of these people looking into these really, you know, cosmology and these really fascinating areas, looking back in time so many billions of years and yet still being able to study what's going on. So welcome, Meg, and uh, we're happy to hand over to you for your, for your talk. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah, for that uh, very generous <laughs> introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming today to listen to my talk. Um, uh, I'm glad to see so many of you today, and I hope that uh, you find the talk uh, interesting as well. I'm going to quickly share my screen. Um, no, it's not so far. Oh, uh, give me one minute. Oops. Okay, sharing my screen. <laughs> um, I hope everyone can see my screen. Yes, yes. Good. Uh, and everyone can hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, so like um, has, Sarah has just introduced, my name is Margaret Ikape. I am uh, rounding up my PhD, hopefully, <laughs> at the University of Toronto, uh, the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics. And the title of my talk today would be Probing uh, the Formation of the First Stars. So uh, I'm very interested in uh, learning about the universe, understanding how the universe uh, began and how it has uh, progressed to what we see today. And one of the, um, the high points for me in this journey of the universe is how the first stars really formed, right? So if you're walking home at night uh, or you look into the night sky, you see so many stars in the night sky, right? Um, as a child, I always wondered where all those stars came from. And uh, according to our current knowledge of the universe, we know that there was a time when there were no stars in the sky. So where did the stars come from? That is uh, where my interest is. That's the question I'm trying to answer for my PhD. Um, okay, so I'm going to begin the talk briefly by introducing myself. I realized that uh, the is a variety of people in this talk today. So um, I apologize if this talk, talk is too basic for you. Uh, I've tried to make sure that I can carry everyone along uh, into this talk. So um, I'm, I'm a Nigerian. I uh, got my BSc in the University of Nigeria, Ansuka. Uh, for my project, my undergrad uh, thesis, I worked with a group of my colleagues and we uh, we built, we, we made a radio telescope, a 2.4 meter radio telescope, uh, just from the local materials we could find uh, around in the neighborhood. And 
uh, this was a good learning experience for me. I should also add that my interest in astronomy began when I was a little child, when I was around six. Um, I saw a shooting star one night when I was out with my family and I was just so interested about all that was going on in the night sky and that's how and all of that led to me deciding to be an astronomer. Okay so after my bachelor's degree in Nigeria I had to um, go to Cameroon and I did a master's program with the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences. Uh, there's actually a center in Ghana, uh, but I was in the Cameroon Center. And in, while in this program, I did a research uh, that was focused on galaxies merging. So we know that um, in the centers of very huge galaxies, uh, there is a supermassive black hole. And sometimes these galaxies collide and merge together. So my, my thesis in the Ames program was trying to understand when these two galaxies collide, what happens to the black holes in their centers. Uh, and then after my, my master's in Cameroon, I came to Toronto and I did another master's program. And one of the projects in that program was trying to understand the, the motion of galaxies, of nearby galaxies, uh, trying to understand how they rotate, their kinematics and all of that. And for this project, I had to use real telescopes. So it was exciting to travel to places uh, where uh, there were huge, very big telescopes, bigger than the one I built in my uh, undergraduate degree. And that was really exciting. <laughs> Uh, okay, and then for my PhD, I decided to do something completely different. I decided I was going to study cosmology. Uh, and here I just have a very short definition of what uh, cosmologists do from Wikipedia. So it says here that cosmologists study the creation, the evolution, and the possible futures of the universe and its galaxies yes okay uh so i'm i'm a cosmologist now and i study the evolution of the universe uh from the beginning if it has a beginning to the end if it will have an end um and this is different from an astronomer slightly different from a, an astronomer we still use the same laws of physics and all of that uh but astronomers uh mostly study individual objects in the night sky. So you have people studying stars or galaxies or groups of galaxies or planets, uh, but cosmologists study everything as a whole. Okay. Uh, so if you have listened to a cosmologist talk before, you probably would have seen this, this slide. It's a uh, very common slide in every cosmology talk. And this is, um, this is like the universe in one slide. This is how we currently understand the evolution of the universe, okay? So the universe uh, is everything that we can see, everything we can touch, everything we can feel, everything we can measure. It includes all the living things, all the planets, all the stars, all the galaxies, everything you can think of is what makes up the universe, right? So this image here shows us the summary of how astronomers think the universe began and how it has evolved. Okay, so scientists believe that the universe began in an event called the Big Bang, uh, which took place nearly 14 billion years ago. That's a very long time. Uh, and at that time, the whole universe, everything that you can think of, everything you can see, and even what you can't see, uh, was inside a bubble that was a thousand times smaller than the 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 pin a pinhead so uh, it, if you can divide a pinhead into a thousand parts that's how <laughs> that was the size of the universe at that time uh and and then uh the, the big bang happened the universe was really hot and really dense uh and then it suddenly uh when the Big Bang happened, we say the universe was born. The universe, as we know it, began. Um, and then in a fraction of a second, the universe uh, uh, inflated. Uh, the universe grew from smaller 
than an atom to the size of a galaxy. And that's what we call inflation. Um, and then the universe uh, was continued to expand. And as it was expanding, the material that was inside the universe uh, began to cool down a bit. And it cooled up to the point where uh, the first atoms could form. So instead of just having electrons and protons uh, flying around in the early universe, it was now cold enough that electrons and protons could combine together to form hydrogen. And what this meant was that the, the light in the universe at that time uh, was free to travel instead of bumping into electrons and protons um, in the early universe. And this is, this happens, uh, this happened at, at this time where my arrow is pointing out. Uh, and because the light from the universe could now travel to us, it meant that this is the first light that the universe- Thank you so Elizabeth. Sorry, was that a question? I think that no, was I an accident. It, yeah, I think it was an accident. Oh, okay, okay. Um, well, if someone has the question, I guess they are free to interrupt me. If Maybe you raise your hand and then I can call on you. Is that okay? I think if we can ask people to put questions in the chat. Okay. I think, I think, that's, I think that'd be better, yeah. All right. Um, okay, so the universe expanded and it could... Uh, the first atoms could form, light could now travel to us, and this is the oldest light we can see from the universe. And this light is called the cosmic microwave background radiation. It is this MB for short. Okay. Um, and then uh, after, after a while, the universe continued to expand, and gravity started to bring uh, lots of this matter, this hydrogen that was in the universe together to form clumps. And then after a while, these clumps got bigger and bigger and bigger. And the cores of these uh, clumps got really, really hot. And then uh, the first stars were formed because, because the cores uh, were really hot now for nuclear fusion to begin inside of them. Uh, so this is the point where the first stars formed. This is where I'm interested in, in this timeline of the universe. Uh, and then this is today. We are here somewhere uh, looking into the past to try to understand how the universe uh, proceeded. Okay, so this is the same image that I've just explained, except that now it's flipped. The Big Bang is on the right-hand side and the present day is on the left hand side and the blue box the, the blue box is where the first stars formed this uh is the period that i'm interested in in the universe uh so this period so um when the first stars formed they did something to the universe they changed the way the universe works okay the universe used to be made up of hydrogen atoms only um, hydrogen, which is like electron and uh, proton combine together to form a neutral hydrogen element, okay? Uh, but when the first stars formed, they began to change the universe from that. So the universe was no longer made up of um, hydrogen, uh, 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 the neutral hydrogen. So it wasn't just the electron and the proton combined together anymore. Because of the radiation that these stars were giving off, the light from the stars was strong enough to knock out the electrons from the hydrogen. And we call that ionization. And so the universe wasn't full of neutral hydrogen anymore. It started to become ionized hydrogen because of those first stars. And we call this process the epoch of reionization. So really what my talk is about, <laughs> what my talk of, uh, is about is the epoch of reionization. And this happened because of those first stars. Uh, in order to understand what happened in the epoch of reionization, we need to understand how the first stars formed and what exactly they did to the universe. 
Okay, so I have this very short video to illustrate uh, what happened in that universe. So uh, quickly, the, the, the white patches you see in this image are the four stars that are forming. And as they are forming, you can see that they, are, they have like some bubbles around them. This is the light that they're giving off. The black uh, places in this image are the, the neutral hydrogen that the universe consists of. Uh, but as these stars are beginning to get uh, to, to form, they're giving off light that is uh, changing the universe from the neutral hydrogen to the ionized hydrogen, right? And this is what we think happened in the epoch of ionization. I think maybe I'll play the video again, just... Uh, so light, the universe is all black. Black represents neutral hydrogen. As the four stars are forming, it's giving off light. Uh, the light is knocking off the electrons from the neutral hydrogen, causing the neutral hydrogen to be ionized. And gradually the universe changes from being completely neutral to being completely ionized because of those four stars. Okay. Um, I feel like this is a good place to pause to ask for questions. <laughs> Does anyone have uh, any questions quickly? Okay, yes, that's a good point because I think that's a, nice, a very good introduction to, <laughs> like you said, to what your work is about. So you feel free to put something in the chat. Otherwise we can... Okay, um, I don't see any questions right now. So if someone has a question, maybe feel uh, free to... Oh, I see one question. How okay. is data for this? Ah, that's a very good question. So this is not data. This is a simulation. We have... Uh, we. This is what we think happened. It, this is not uh, observation. This is not data from any telescope. Uh, but very soon, we're going to get data from telescope that will tell us exactly what happened. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. When did gravity start? When, uh, I see another question. Okay. When did gravity start? When did, when the universe was very hot in the beginning? Why didn't stars form? Ah. Uh, that is a very good question. That is a very good question that I probably need to think about for a minute. Okay, I have to say, I, now uh, there's quite a few questions, but I think it's better if Meg finishes her talk because there's some very good questions, but I suspect what will happen is we'll kind of go off and <laughs> we won't have time to finish the talk. So do keep your questions coming in, but I think it's better if Meg talks and then we, we come to as many questions as we can at the end. Is that okay? okay? Um, yeah. Yes, I think I like that. Um, I see your question, Josiah, and I'll, I'll come to it at the end of the talk and try to answer it as best as I can. But yes, that is a very good question and um, I'll come back to that. Okay, so um, moving on quickly. Um, so I said that um, the point when the universe cooled to uh, when the universe cooled such that um, uh, neutral hydrogen could form and the light uh, could travel to us from the beginning of time. That light is called the cosmic microwave background radiation, the CMB. This is the earliest light from the universe that we can see, that we can we have seen so far. And uh, because it's the oldest light from the universe, it holds information to what the universe used to be like in the beginning. So my job is to study this light and try to understand what the universe was, uh, was like in the beginning. So this is kind of like the baby picture of the universe uh, if you, if, if um, maybe that's a better way to explain it. So, um, um, so we know what the baby picture of the universe looks like and we're trying to understand, we're trying to get clues from this image uh, as to what the universe 
used to look like, okay? So uh, the different colors you see in this map, this is a map of the whole sky. Um, the different colors you see tell us the places in the early universe where there were, sl there were slight uh, temperature differences in the universe. So the blue places are places where the temperature was a little bit hotter and the red places uh, are regions where the temperature was a little bit colder and, and also density differences. So the blue places would be where uh, there's a lot more matter and the red places would be places where there's not a lot of matter. Okay. Um, so the way I use this slide, this uh, CMB to prove the epochal realization is this. And the reason why I'm even able to, to do that is because this light, this CMB can be distorted, right? So what happens when I say the CMB can be distorted? We know what, it, we know what that baby picture of the universe should look like, okay? And so when the light from the CMB is traveling to us, remember that this this happened so, so long ago. When that light is traveling to us, it has to pass through everything that is between us and the Big, the big Bang. So it passes through all the galaxies, all the stars, the very first stars, and travels, 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 until it gets to our telescope. And what happens as that light is traveling is that it, it interacts with galaxies. And so when you have... Uh, galaxies, uh, galaxies have uh, lots of hot gas around them. So when this CMB uh, lights, photons, we call that photons, when the light from the CMB is traveling through the universe to get to us, when it uh, interacts with the electrons, the, the hot gas within galaxies, the electron in the galaxies has the ability to either bump up the, the energy of the CMB photon or cause it to go down, okay? And when that happens, it causes what we see from the CMB to change. That's why I say the CMB can be distorted. Um, so depending on what the interaction of the CMB photon is with the uh, cloud of hot gas around the galaxies, we either get an artificial hot spot on the CMB or an artificial, artificial in quotes, uh, or an artificial hot uh, cold spot on the CMB. Okay. Um, and so we can use this distortion to learn about the early universe because uh, there were lot, when the pro stars were forming, there were lots of uh, hot electrons in the early universe. Remember I said that the first stars, when they formed, they were giving off this ionization, this radiation that was able to strip off the electrons from the hydrogen atoms. And so that's where the interaction comes from. And we can use that to learn about uh, the, the epoch of ionization. Okay, so here is going to, it's probably going a little bit uh, technical, for people, and I apologize for that. Uh, but I just quickly want to say that uh, so far it's not been so easy to find the signal from the CMB that tells us about the first stars because the interaction we see has two components. Uh, there's the one. There's one component that happened at very. Uh, far red shifts, which is what corresponds to the epoch of realization. And then there is a component of this uh, interaction of the CMB photon. And we call this interaction actually the KZ effect. It's called the Suyev Zeldovich effect. Just uh, for short, we're just going to call it the KZ effect. Uh, and then there is the other component that happened at early times, uh, late times rather, which is like cl close redshifts to us. So there are these two parts of the same thing that uh, we need to understand and, and differentiate because only one of them tells us about realization, which is important to understand the very first stars. And 
Uh, that's one of the challenges we have because this uh, KZ effect happens uh, in the early universe and then happens uh, again close to us because of all the galaxies that are forming uh, at close redshifts. Um, so we need to understand the two effects because when we take our telescopes out and we observe the CMB, we are looking at all of the KZ effects, right? So we need to be able to differentiate which one is coming from the early universe and which one is coming from the redshifts close to us. So that's one of the uh, challenges in this study so far. And um, here I want to also point out that this KZ signal that we're trying to measure, apart from the challenge of having to differentiate between the two components, it's also very, very, very hard to measure it. It's so difficult. And the reason it's so difficult is because uh, the, the, it's because of probability, right? So the probability of the, the light from the CMB interacting with an electron in that early universe is so small. The, the, it's so small because it's, the probability is just so small for an electron to interact with the, the photon. And so this signal is very, very hard to measure. And because of that, we need to build density. Yeah, yeah, you put it here, compress the planetarium. Now, my friend. My friend, also, we have fast results. Yeah, quite yet. That's a you know, mini for the Okay. Um, yeah, so because this KSS signal is very small, we need to build very sensitive telescopes that can measure the very faint light from the uh, early universe. And that's uh, where my work comes in mostly, I guess. Um, so for my research, I'm working with the Simons Observatory, which is a telescope that is being built in Chile, uh, somewhere in South of South America. Um, this telescope is still being built. When it is completed, it will be the, to be one of the best telescopes that can observe the early universe and observe the, the CMB lights that I have just talked about. Um, and so we're hoping that when the telescope uh, is completed, we're hoping that it would get, it would be up and running mm -hmm. this year. And so we're hoping that we would begin to understand more about the universe. And this takes me to the very first question that was asked. Now we are going to be able to get data to understand what happened in the epoch of realization. And while we are waiting for data, we can still do simulations to understand the epoch of realization and then test our simulations with data when the telescopes are are uh, 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 ready, okay? So the simulation I use, this is just me putting physics uh, equations into a computer and running it backwards. So from all the, from what we know about the universe right now, we put those laws of, of physics in a computer, and then we run it backwards. It's like when you're watching a movie and you skip something, you rewind it. So that's just what we're doing right now. Uh, so we rewind the universe uh, in our computers to the beginning of time and try to uh, make predictions of what the universe looks like back then. So this is a rough picture of what my simulation uh, is like. There are three main um, parameters in my simulation and they include the very, the most important one to me is the, the mass of those stars. So I want to know how big those very first stars were, like what their sizes were. And I need to know how powerful the lights they gave off, the lights that caused the ionization of the universe. That's what I call ionization efficiency here. And then I want to know how far did these lights travel before it uh, was able to knock off an electron from, a, from the hydrogen atom. 
that's what I call the photon being free part here, because that tells us uh, a lot about the, those four stars. Um, okay, so I guess now I have a question for all of you, and you can put the answers in the chat. Uh, this is just going to take 30 seconds. So do you think the four stars are different from the stars we see now, yes or no? You can give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down if you want, or you can put the answers in the chat. Uh, yes, yeah, so people can feel free, even if you, you, you're you not sure, just make a guess. Do you think yeah. the first stars that happened, that were formed all the way back then, do you think they're different from the stars we can see now? So either yes or no. I see thumbs up, I see lots of guesses, so that's good. I see one no, I see two no's. <laughs> Okay, uh, okay, I'm going to thank you all for responding. Someone says yes and no. <laughs> Hedging their bets. <laughs> Why you think yes and no, but uh, uh, in terms of composition, no. Uh, this person is going uh, deeper, that's good. Okay, so uh, because of our time, I'm just going to skip ahead and reveal the answer, ta-da. <laughs> Um, so for all of you that said, uh, uh oh, my slide, yes, for all of you that said yes, yay, the answer is yes, the four stars, we think, we believe, uh, that the four stars were very different from the stars we see today. And for those of you that said no, I'm curious to know what you think about this. And like, really, there's no first, there's no uh, right or wrong and so uh, as scientists we try to uh, weigh all our options before we make conclusions right so uh, for now we think that the first stars are different from what we see today the, the stars we see today but we haven't seen any of those first stars yet to be so sure okay but anyway uh, from the results that our simulations have been giving us so far we see that the first stars are huge. They are so huge. They're way bigger than the stars we see today, at least when we use the sun as the unit of measurement. Okay, so astronomers like to do these things where uh, because the numbers get so big, we use uh, objects as the unit of measurement. So here, our, our unit of measurement is the mass of the sun. So we get uh, that the masses of those very four stars were so, okay, this is 10 to the power nine times the mass of the sun. And in case this number is huge and doesn't make sense to you, it is just one with nine zeros behind it. Okay, this is like, I don't know, a hundred billion times the mass of the sun. That's a huge number. I don't even know how to imagine what the sun for the star uh, like that would look like. But this uh, is our result so far. And it's pointing to the fact that yes, the four stars are a lot different, at least when it comes to size. Uh, the four stars are a lot different from what we see today. Uh, okay, so that's uh, the end of my talk. Uh, just a quick summary slide. Uh, we're hoping that with telescopes like the Simons Observatory, we are going to uh, have more insights into the beginning of the universe and in particular understand the epoch of realization and uh, learn more about the history of the universe. So thank you all for listening and I'll take questions now. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Meg. My mind is, is blowing. My mind's just going boom. <laughs> um, do, do you want? Oh, well, I suppose people might. I was going to say you could stop sharing, but I don't know if people might want yeah. to go back to some of your uh, slides. Um, now, then, <laughs> okay, let me just first of all say um, we are, in theory, our session is supposed to be one hour, but we are almost at five already. But obviously, if you don't have, if you don't need to rush off for anything else, anybody, and you're happy to stay, then we can try and. Uh, answer you know as many questions as, as we can um, but just so you know because it, we are getting to five so 
Yes, Meg, you're going to be busy. There are lots of questions. <laughs> uh, maybe uh, Daniel can also uh, help. Um, wow, I'm scrolling back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so someone, one of the things you, you did mention that someone, I think, Josiah, when did gravity start? Yes. Um, one of yes, that is, uh, that is a very good question. And um, uh, I, I'm trying to find the right words to explain, to, to explain that question and so that I don't mess it up. Um, I think <laughs> I think the answer that comes to mind right now. You, you the question is when did gravity start? I don't yes. know. I don't know when gravity started. Um, but the thing to bear in mind is that the force of gravity increases when certain things are in place, right? Uh, so we know that. Um, so the gravitational force, and this is just as an example, the gravitational force we feel from the sun is a lot different from the gravitational force that we feel from Pluto, right? It doesn't mean that Pluto is not there. It doesn't mean that we don't feel gravity from Pluto. It's, it's the, the force is just different because things, because the situation is different, right? When you look at the equation of gravity, you have to consider distance, you have to consider the masses of the two things that are involved. And because the sun is closer to us and because it's bigger, therefore the gravity we feel from the sun is a lot more than say from Pluto, which is smaller and more and further away, right? So thinking about that and going back to the early universe, I'm thinking gravity probably has been in effect for a while, but the force wasn't as pronounced until massive objects could form. And by massive objects, I'm talking atom, hydrogen atom, right? So hydrogen atom is, the hydrogen atom is a lot heavier than say electrons and protons flying around in the universe. So when that happens, the force of gravity is now pronounced and uh, begins to have a big kind of, if that makes sense. Um, that is, that is a very naive answer to say that this question is, it goes beyond what I've just said, because when we think about gravity in the early universe, we have to also think about dark energy and dark matter, that, which I really don't know. <laughs> um, so so that, that question is, is very loaded and we, we maybe have a discussion about it later, if that's okay. But so far, I hope um, I hope I have answered as simply as simply as I can. <laughs> that was a good question. Let me just sorry, I've lost my thing now. Sorry, let me Daniel. If you can also see any questions, let me know. I'm sorry, I'm just scrolling through to find. Uh, let me uh, jump to somebody else's question. I know J Josiah actually had another question, but let me jump to something from Samuel. Um, did all the isotopes of hydrogen form at the same time? Uh, that is a good question. No, the isotopes of hydrogen did not all form at the same time. Um, um, hydrogen, I, we think, at least from the... Uh, the history of the universe we we have we we the way we uh, understand the universe so far we think that uh, deuterium formed first that was the easiest um, at, that was the first um, atom that formed before uh, um, hydrogen um, formed. Um, oh, and then, and I guess, oh, sorry. Deuterium is um, 
literature is 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 is, is um I guess it's the one of the isotopes of hydrogen and it is it is more stable and so when it forms it doesn't it doesn't dissociate because of all the things happening happening in the early universe. Um I, I think I'm maybe confusing you at this point, but uh, this the simple answer to the question is no, all the um isotopes did not form at the same time. <laughs> Cool. Then there's another question, which actually I'll, uh, yeah, again, in a way, leading up from that. And if I can sort of also kind of add my own question to it. Uh, so someone asked, how did helium form? So because I, I suppose I would think was I wasn't sure if does did helium form, you know, if you like, on its own? I mean, after the Big Bang, or was it only formed in the center of the first star? Because I know that when hydrogen fuses inside a star, it forms helium. But was some helium also formed kind of before the first stars, like just from the from the Big Bang and everything all whizzing about together? Yes, uh, that is a very good question. The answer is yes. Uh, some helium formed in the early universe. So when we think about the early universe, uh, the composition that astronomers work with right now, uh, we know that the universe was mostly hydrogen in the beginning, but there were a few traces of helium, right? Like three percent or to 3%, I think, of helium uh, forming in the early universe. And the process is the same. Uh, you can think of the universe, the early universe, like a giant star, right? Uh, the nuclear fusion process is what's happening also. So as, as hydrogen forms um, uh, and then collisions happen uh, after a while, helium can form. Uh, the reason helium, there's not a lot of helium in the early universe is because the universe is expanding, right? Stars don't expand like that. So the early universe is expanding and it's harder, it gets harder and harder to, to fuse hydrogen atoms together to form helium. And so it gets to a point in the un early universe when it has expanded so much that no more helium can form. And so the rest of the helium now forms in stars. Does that answer the question? Yes, okay, good. Okay, so um, Samuel asked, I'm not sure if this was to do with the cosmic microwave background. Um, aside microwaves, if you used infrared or visible light, will you get the same information? I don't know, Samuel, was that, were you talking about the CMB, the cosmic microwave background? Yeah. Um, if someone wants to unmute and say, I think, yes, that would be fine. But um, Samuel, are I... you are you here? This may be dropped off. I see Samuel. Well, there's more than oh no, 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 no. Yeah, if I understand this question, um, um, uh, the short answer is no we will not get the same information. And the reason is, the reason again is because the universe is expanding, right? So uh, uh, this phenomena is what we call Doppler shifts. Um, if you, if you um, hear a siren pass by you, right? When the, the police car or the ambulance is very far away from you, you hear the pitch of the sound differently, but when it's closer to you, you hear it a lot differently, right? Uh, so it increases as it comes closer to you. And that's because uh, the waves from the sound are getting closer and closer to you. And so it increases. Uh, the same thing happens to light, right? As light is traveling to you, light ha has um, wavelengths, right? So, and the wavelength is, uh, proportional to the energy that the light carries, um, that the light has. <laughs> um, and so when the early universe, when uh, the Big Bang happened, the universe was really hot and really energetic. At that point, we think that the light was very energetic, probably in UV. That's the strong, one of the strongest types of light we have, ultraviolet. Uh, but the universe was expanding 
and the light was stretching, right? The wavelength of the light was stretching. So from the UV, the light, uh, the universe has expanded and stretched this light from the cosmic microwave background such that we cannot see it in the visible anymore. And we cannot see it in the infrared because it has stretched past those wavelengths. And now it is in the microwave region of, of light of the electromagnetic spectrum. That's why we call it the cosmic microwave background because we can only see it in the microwave. I hope that was the question you were asking. <laughs> yes, I hope so too. Okay, I'm moving on. So uh, Jahan asked, are there different universes? That is an extremely good question that astronomers are still trying to figure us out as well. We, we don't know. The answer is we don't know. There probably is or there is not, but we don't know. We have no way to... Um, well, people, uh, my colleagues who do uh, theory, like that is the solve maths, the physics of the universe, they are coming up with different ways to answer this question uh, right now, but so far we don't know. Thank you, thank you. Okay, um, a question from Josiah. I feel like this is almost like a philosophical question maybe. Do you think when the universe started, all the laws of the universe and all universal constants came with it, or the universe, quotes, thinks of it and adopts the laws and constants along the way? Well, we really, I have to say, usually we do not get questions like this. I mean, Margaret, your talk has inspired people to ask amazing questions this month. I'm very impressed. Yeah, that is a very good question and I'm trying to think about um, what we call this in in astronomy um, yes the the no this is not the Drake's equation what is what is this called um, um so the Short answer to your question is that I'm I'm even confused right now. <laughs> um, I guess in some way you can think that the the um, statistically speaking, the universe has. Um, to put it the way you say, the universe thinks about it and has conformed all these law, these constants to the right values so that it is conducive for us, right? Um, um, yeah, this is, this is a tricky question. <laughs> Uh, or what is what is that thing called? Um, or some, well, you know, some questions we might have to park, and then we we can always send some of the questions on to you, Meg, and you can have a think about it, maybe. Because I think the, you know, your talk, I mean, it's great. You know, your literally your talk is inspiring all these amazing questions, but they're not easy. Then you know, so we, we, maybe in our time we can't always you know, come up with a nice answer for everyone's questions. So, but we can maybe try and always pass them on it's, to you later. Just asking me what we, there's, there's this word we use in astronomy uh, to, to explain this particular question, but it's just escaping me right now. Uh, but yes, I can maybe get back to you just. <laughs> and then there's a few questions came up when you we were talking about the stars. I think maybe if you could just maybe say a bit more about, um, I mean, I know you, you said your research showed that the first stars were bigger, but this whole thing about, it, you know, why should the first stars be different? Or And someone said, is it just the size? Is it the temperature, radiation? What's the... Yeah, so uh, the first stars are different from the stars we see today in terms of size, like our research has shown, but that's not the only way they are different. We also think that 
Uh, I think someone mentioned composition in the chat. We also think that they are different in terms of composition. So for example, the sun is made up of hydrogen and helium and carbon and all of those elements, right? Uh, but in the early universe, there were no, there was no carbon and there was very little helium, like we've just discussed, right? So there was only the material that stars could form from was just hydrogen. So those early stars were mostly made up of only hydrogen. Uh, so in that way, they're different um, because they were huge. So in when star, the bigger the star is, the the hotter it is. So we think that those first stars were probably also very, very hot, hotter than the stars we see today. And because they were very big and very hot, it meant that they were, they lived very short lives. So the sun, for example, is going to live up to 10 billion years. Um, but those early stars did not live so long because they were really big, really hot. They just born through their hydrogen cause very quickly. And so they lived very short lives. Um, those are some of the ways we think that the first stars are different from the stars we see today. Cool, thank you. Um, now I'm scrolling through and there's quite a few, there's some similar questions. So, and if there's one which I will answer, but, and, and Meg, feel free to come in, because people have asked things about um, why is it that some of the planets don't have gravity or why is Earth the only planet that have gravity? So I can answer this one. So, uh, all the planets have gravity. In fact, everything has gravity. You have gravity, I have gravity, we all have gravity. Uh, but as Meg was saying, the, the, when something is bigger, uh, you know, or depending on the circumstances, the, the, the force can be greater. So if, so if you've seen photographs of, of you know, the, the astronauts on the moon, it looks like they're kind of half floating around. Uh, they're not sort of anchored to the floor as much because that's because the moon is smaller, has a smaller mass than the earth, so the force of gravity is less. It doesn't pull them to the earth as strongly. So, so all the planets have gravity. If you were on Pluto, again, that's small, so you wouldn't be pulled to the surface of Pluto as, as strongly as you are to the surface of Earth. I hope I've answered that correctly. Some have been, we've answered already, multiple universes, helium, blah, 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 other multiple universes. Oh yeah, sorry, some people have already answered. Uh, everyone's fascinated about the idea of different universes. That has come up multiple times. <laughs> uh, okay, oh sorry, some people have already answered that. Is it true that there's another universe where humans live? Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> that would be fun, um, <laughs> but I don't know. Uh, first of all, we don't know if there are other universes. And secondly, we don't know if there's life. We haven't seen uh, life like humans in any other world, uh, so. We don't know. Yes, as as Mike said, we, as far as other universes, we 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 don't know about those anyway. But if it's, I mean, generally life, even in our universe, everyone loves to talk about aliens, and we're all fascinated by the idea that there could be life elsewhere. But so far, we have not found any evidence. You know, maybe we'll find it, but we haven't found any yet. Yeah. Okay. I just I think with with time we maybe just have a couple more questions sorry I'm scrolling through there seems to be a... I see one question just coming from Queen Esther about why Pluto is not a planet anymore <laughs> our favorite yeah should I go for it uh, uh, yes yes if you want next I'll, I'll, I'll let me look through and see if there's anything else okay. uh sure to answer your question uh Queen Esther um the reason Pluto is not a planet anymore is because uh, a group of astronomers uh, had a meeting one time and decided that they wanted to change the definition of what a planet was. Okay, so Pluto doesn't meet that criteria, it doesn't meet the definition of what a planet should be. That's why it's no longer a planet. Okay, uh, that definition includes the fact that a planet has to be uh, 
uh, big enough for gravity to make it a rounded object. So it shouldn't be oblong or potato shaped or something. It needs to be around. It needs to be big enough to be round. Uh, it also needs to go around the sun. Um, and then it needs to be big enough that it clears its environment. So there should be no uh, debris flying around the object. Uh, so Pluto meets two out of three of those criteria, but then it had to be no longer a planet because it doesn't meet all three criteria. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> I think I'm very keen on sometimes people say, why has Pluto been demoted and this sort of thing? And I feel very strongly that you should we shouldn't think of it as being like a, you know, oh, Pluto's not as important anymore. It's been downgraded. This is a terrible thing. It's it's purely reclassification. So in science, there's everything is classified. I'm sure some of you have learned about whether it's animals, plants, we classify. And uh, you know, it's it's the, with um, better telescopes and better technology, we discovered that Pluto was very different um, to these other objects. And, and so a, a new category was made. And, and who knows, maybe in the future, there'll be another new category, we don't know. So it's, uh, it's just one of those. And I always tell people that because Pluto is no longer a planet, doesn't mean it's no longer in our solar system. It's yes, still very yes. uh, still there. It's still useful. We still study it. It's just not called a plant. It's just been given a different name. Uh, let's think about it like that. Exactly, so. exactly. Now, I just there's something I wanted to say at the beginning. I, I meant to say, I believe we have uh, some students from, um, is it DCA, Dominion Christian Academy? Uh, if you're here, you can give us a little wave. Thank you for coming. Um, now, I uh, maybe I shouldn't say, maybe a bit cheeky. Uh, I believe you were asked to attend. It was like an assignment, but I hope you you are also enjoying it. You're not just coming because it's an assignment, but also because you're interested and I hope you've also learned something. And I think there may also be some students from GIS, I saw from the, the email. So I hope it's nice to have a lot of younger people, students here. So, so uh, welcome and I hope you've been um, enjoying it. Um, now, I saw uh, again a classic question which might have to be one of the last ones. It's gone, it's lost now. Which was, oh, what triggered the Big Bang? Yeah, okay. Uh, that is a very good question. <laughs> Again, I, I guess I can imagine. Who asked the question? Okay, so, Decide. well, that's the question that we are also still trying to figure out what triggered the, the, the Big Bang, uh, we don't know. We, we just, uh, we don't know what triggered the Big Bang. Uh, uncertainties in the early universe, uh, oops, sorry, quantum fluctuations in the early universe have led to that, but we really don't know. I think it's uh, these, hold on, just a moment, just a moment. Uh, I also think, you know, questions that we haven't answered yet or questions that we can't answer, that's still, you know, that's part of the wonder of science. You know, if we, if we could answer all the questions, then it'd be, like, oh, well, we know everything. But no, there's always more questions and these things, uh, you know, sometimes we might get closer to it with more technology. Sometimes it might be something you know, it takes a lot longer. Think of um, Einstein's theories. It took like a hundred years to prove some of his predictions. So we, we, it's, it's fascinating that, uh, you know, we, we learn more and, uh, you know, we're always finding out more about the universe. Um, yes. was, was, sorry, yeah. Oh, oh, follow question. Can, can I... oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, even though I don't have any... Uh... I mean, there's no proof to what I'm going to say, but I think it was as a result of um, the failure of gravity to hold things as they were that brought the explosion of the Big Bang. Because if you try to make sense of everything we know now, you, you, you realize it's, um, it's gravity that is holding everything together. I mean, that's trying to pull everything towards the center of everything. And we don't, yes, we, we don't have any uh, proving scientific fact to this, but I think it might, we, we, 
maybe one day that's uh, the answer we will get. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that insight. Um, I think one thing to also bear in mind is that the, the Big Bang happened at a time where um, some, of our, some of the laws of physics breaks because, because it's just, we're just not able to understand what's happening at that time yet. And so even things like, even the law of gravity probably doesn't hold at that time yet. And it, it's, it's just a tricky point in the universe to try to understand with the physics the way we know it right now. But, but your insight is really good. And uh, I, don't, I don't study the Big Bang and the very, very early universe. So I don't know a lot about it, but um, maybe. <laughs> okay, thank you. So I think what we're going to do because of time, I so said I will keep the chat and I will actually, because we've had a lot of questions today. So I will honestly try and keep the chat. And I know there's quite a few multiples of the same questions and, and get some answers to you. Well, because what I'd like to do is just quickly finish off. Uh, we do a little bit about the night sky. Um, maybe after that, we can stay for another maybe 10 minutes or so if, if you're around, Meg, you know, just for a, a few more questions if people are very keen, but then we will have to stop at one point. But let me just quickly share my screen just to finish off. So what we do like to do is encourage everybody to look up at the night sky. So just to let you know what's happening in the night sky over the next few weeks or so. So nowadays it's good you can see our big giant planet Saturn and Jupiter. So really immediately after sunset you'll be able to see Saturn and then Jupiter, uh, well it'll kind of rise up by about eight-ish, you should be able to see it. Uh, quite well. And Jupiter is, is very bright, uh, should be easy to spot, Saturn not quite so bright. And then Mars, if you're up late, Mars rises after about 11 or so in the evening. So Saturn, Jupiter and Mars, you can definitely see. And then if you're still finding them a bit difficult to spot, on certain days the moon will be near to those planets and then obviously it's easier to find them. So on the 5th the moon will be close to Saturn, on the 8th it will be close to Jupiter, and on the 15th, it will be close to um, Mars. Uh, and actually here, I don't know how clear that is, but actually also there's a, a very well-known constellation here called Orion. So, and I should say that Mars, you know, we call it the red planet, even with the naked eye, it is, uh, has a reddish tinge to it. So, and there are also a couple of other red stars here. Aldebaran is part of Taurus and Betelgeuse is part of Orion. So. Uh, is the one on the 15th that's closest to the moon is planet Mars. Okay, and then on 1st of October, it's actually International Observe the Moon Night. Uh, so it's just a day when we encourage everybody to go out and look at the moon. And of course, you'll also be able to see Jupiter and Saturn. And the, the phase of the moon here, it'll be like a, what's called a waxing crescent. So it's getting a bit larger crescent, but it's getting larger. If, if you happen to have binoculars or a small telescope, you'll really be able to see all the craters, which are fantastic. Um, and again, another constellation just below the moon is Scorpio. And if you can see this curving tail, that's like the, you know, the, the tail of the, uh, the scorpion there. So please go out and have a look at the moon and encourage other people to do so. Oh, very quickly. Oh, here's a quick, right, quick video. And quickly in the chat, what, what do you think you're seeing here? Uh, maybe Daniel or somebody can let me know if there's anything in chat. What do you think you're looking at here? Any ideas, any guesses? Someone is saying uh, ice, the forest. Ice? Okay. <laughs> Any other guesses? Let's play it again. Clouds. Okay. 
clouds um, surface of Neptune, a star or a planet, a gas. So nice ideas, good ideas there. A storm, a storm. Okay. Okay. So actually this is, well, this is an animation, but it's an animation of what scientists think the cloud tops of Jupiter look like. So Jupiter, as I'm sure you know, is a gas giant and it has all these amazing swirling gases in the atmosphere. And what people have done is looked at the amazing photos that they've got of the cloud tops and they can do some very clever maths and work out how high the different layers of cloud are. Uh, and so from that, those calculations, they've, they've created this animation. So it's not like a video for, of real images, but it's an, it's an animation made from, real, from the real images, if you see what I mean. So if one day we could get on a spaceship and fly to Jupiter, this is what it might look like, which is really, really cool. I couldn't resist <laughs> showing that one. Yeah. So Jupiter is my favourite planet because I think it's just the coolest. Okay, so quickly some announcements. Uh, Daniel, uh, and over to you for this yes. very exciting announcement. Okay, so um, this coming uh, Saturday, that's exactly one week from now on the 1st of October, we are going to be having the first ever Ghana Kansas Rocketry Championship, which is the first in Africa and in Middle East. Now, this championship is uh, it's about students from uh, around Ghana in the tertiary schools like the universities who come together to build mini satellites called the CANSAT. So basically a satellite but in a miniature like form in a CAN dimension. So what the students are supposed to do is to come together, design and build the CANSAT and this concept is supposed to fly into the atmosphere by the use of uh, hydrogen gas. This um, hydrogen gas uh, is supposed to be, be powered through a balloon powered by hydrogen gas. Yes, yeah, so it's going to fly with a balloon because now it's, it's quite expensive to use like a rocket. So we are using a balloon for the first one. So during flight, it's supposed to measure the air pollution in the atmosphere and uh, simultaneously send the data into your computer to display the measurements you are doing. And you know, it's a really a fun event. It's more than a competition actually, because it's a way students get to understand how NASA actually launches their satellite, like the processes they go through, the problems they encounter doing, because sometimes you don't think about the problem, but when you actually put it to the test, you realize like some things that happen in a miniature way. So, and it's a good way to bring students across Africa into space science and also for networking, very good for networking too. Yeah, so we're, we are very excited and it should be starting at six hours a day. Yeah. Great, thank you, Daniel. I think, are you able to, so, so it, it is possible for people to register to attend, although there are limited places. Uh, that's to, just to attend to watch, I mean, the, the competition itself, you know, the teams are already ready, um, uh, but uh, it is possible to attend. Daniel, I don't know if you can put the link in the chat. I, have, I haven't got yes, it. Yes, yes. Um, but yeah, I'm very impressed. Oh, Solomon um, put it. Okay, so yes, thanks, Solomon. So I think I'm very impressed with this whole uh, idea, this whole competition. It's been going for several months, you know, that all the teams from the different institutions have been working hard, and so this, this yeah. will be the final to... Uh, to see how everyone's done. Uh, and uh, uh, Daniel, I believe you are actually taking part. Yes, I am. I am. <laughs> I'm actually taking part. So, so, so <laughs> good luck good. to your team. Good luck to your team. So that's Thank you. great. Thank you. And, and they hope, I believe the idea is hopefully, obviously they want to keep, this is only the first one, they hope to do more in future. And if possible, yes. maybe even start doing this at like high school level. So some of the students who are here today, maybe if you're interested, uh, maybe we can contact your schools and see if that's something that could be done in future. Yes, yes. Okay, so just to say also, we uh, obviously we will continue these talks every month, the last Saturday of each month, we'll be here. So we, as you can see, we talk to different people, we talk about different topics and then other things just to keep an eye out for. Remember 26th of September is the, the DART impact, um, 
Uh, you know, normally there'll be someone like NASA TV and all these things. They'll have live uh, uh, live broadcast, not necessarily a live, you know, images, because that can only happen if there's a camera there, but it will have people in the control centre who are telling you what's happening, because they'll be getting signals back from the spacecraft so they know what's happening. And then the 27th, hopefully, Artemis 1 launch. Ah, now another thing for um, uh, students, there is an art competition for speci specifically for students about the James Webb space telescope um, it's uh, um, wanting you to draw uh, what you think the telescope should look at or what you hope it will discover and the deadline is the 30th um, because I'm showing my screen I can't actually give you the link right now if necessary I'll send it by email to everybody but it's there's some links to some talks and resources about the telescope uh, and after you've seen that hopefully you'll be inspired and you can uh, uh, do your drawing, send it in, and you can win some cool prizes. So that's the art competition. Uh, as we already said, October the 1st is International Observe the Moon Night. And after that, 4th the 10th of October is World Space Week. Um, and usually all these organizations, they have a website with some very interesting you know, resources and, uh, and, and other things where you can find out more and activities and all sorts of things like that. So, those are lots of things coming up. So thank you all very much for coming. It's been a very lively uh, event today. So thank you, Meg, very much for your talk. And thank you, Daniel, for helping out.